Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Now on to the superintendent's report. The Jackson Public School District places great emphasis on literacy and reading. Read Across America Day. Clap your hands, stomp your feet. Read all the books you want to read. And all the books you want to see. And in celebration of Read Across America Week, JPS scholars from elementary, middle, and high school gained a better understanding about the importance of reading and the impact it can have on their lives. We have invited our community partners to read to our scholars today so that our scholars will have a joy for reading. The week-long celebration, which coincided with Dr. Seuss's birthday, was an opportunity for the community to inspire scholars. And just be a part of the classroom with our young people uh, and with our educators. It's just so important for them to see us as a part of their educational process. To read to them and just share the art and the love of reading and literacy. You can learn about sad and glad and mad. There are so many things you can learn about. I love to read. Reading is fun. JPS held its annual reading fair at Cardozo Middle School to celebrate enthusiastic book readers from across the district. And we are so excited to have participants from all over the district, elementary, middle, and high school, to participate and to show all that they've learned in reading a particular text. Scholars created an array of exhibits, both imaginative and visually stunning. Each exhibit was a creative representation of the books that each participant read. JPS scholars received honor for their creativity, imagination, and love of literature. A lesson on the importance of reading from Mississippi's First Lady, Ely Reeves, who visited two JPS schools, Bates and Key Elementary, as part of her statewide book tour reading to fourth grade scholars. This has been a, a tremendous um, experience to share this with the students here at Key Elementary and I'm just I'm, I'm so proud of them. The story of Fred the Turtle, an activity coloring book, came to life as young students listened and learned and were encouraged that books are a big part of learning. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com forward slash JPSITV. Effectively bringing the, the district to, to a halt. And um, the strike was um, uh, uh, really looking at and, and, and shining a light on compensation issues and, and a need to better compensate um, especially the classified team members, the lowest wage earners. Um, they, like other districts around the country, including Jackson Public Schools, are struggling to attract and retain uh, those team members into, well, really across the district in all of the roles, um, but most especially in those um, those uh, uh, classified positions. We are having similar struggles. Uh, I believe that's not a secret to anyone here. We, um, we are working to try to treat our people well and to make their jobs as um, a little easier and, and trying to support them with the resources that they need, but um, we've, we've got to continue to look at and, and impact compensation <laughs> as well. And so um, just because this was in the news and it's such a national story and it's you know, bringing that district to its knees, um, just thought it would be uh, appropriate to lift up again here that um, our intent, board members, is to bring to you a budget, um, to build a budget and bring it to you uh, for your support for this next fiscal year that um, addresses some of the, the issues that we've seen and that we know exist around compensation and most especially for our classified team members. And so um, as, as we're working towards that, and I know we'll start um, in earnest the uh, finance committee meetings and, and board work sessions that build towards the uh, final budget being uh, presented to you for, for action. Um, just wanted to again signal, uh, given this most recent um, uh, issue in the news, that, that this is something we're dealing with and we want to try and address it 
um, up front. This is just one more reason, I'll lift up again, why we believe it's so imperative that our state uh, fully funds um, the MAEP, the Mississippi Adequate Education Program, the funding formula for public education. And so um, we just want to continue to lift our voices um, in, that, in that area and acknowledge that um, we've got wonderful folks who are doing really hard work, really important work, but we've got to, uh, we've got to demonstrate that we value them. And that's something that uh, is on my heart, so I wanted to share that. Lastly, board members this evening, um, each year the JROTC department names a Cadet of the Year. The Cadet of the Year competition is a rigorous process uh, that begins at the school level. In the district level, uh, at the district level, the competition becomes more involved and, and more intense. The cadets must submit a comprehensive portfolio that includes a resume with references, uh, examples of their academic work, their GPA and class standing records, an essay, proof of community service work, physical fitness, and more. It's a pretty rigorous selection process. I am pleased to welcome uh, Colonel Frederick Brown, our JROTC director, who will join us to introduce our fantastic scholar um, this evening and tell us more about the selection process. Colonel Moore. Good afternoon, wow. Good afternoon uh, Dr. Sivak and the school board members, Dr. Green, and the JPS members, parents, and administrators. I'm Colonel Brown, the director of Army JRTC, Jackson Public School District. I would like this afternoon, and I'm honored to recognize our Cadet of the Year. I would like to ask Cadet Colonel Tylene McLaurin to please come forward. Cadet Colonel Tylene McLaurin is the 2023-24 Jackson Public School District Cadet of the Year. <laughs> Cadet McLaurin was promoted to the rank of Colonel on February the 22nd. She will serve as our new JRTC Cadet Brigade Commander. Awesome. Cadet McLaurin is a junior at Callaway High School, and she is truly an extraordinary person <laughs> outstanding scholar and leader. She is highly dedicated, goal-oriented, and works diligently toward her passions. She believes that to be a successful leader, you will need to res respect authority, have an ethical mindset 24-7, and have the courage to take on new responsibilities and face new challenges every day in life. When she sets her mind on a new specific outcome, she strives for perfection and takes the responsibility of working hard until the mission is complete. She credits herself, she credits her family, instructors, and community, and the community for always enhancing her, encouraging her to become the best version of herself. Cadet Colonel McLaurin has been very active in, within the JRTC program throughout her years in high school. She participates as a member of the Callaway JRTC drill team, the color guard detail, and the cadet leadership staff. She is also a member of the National Junior Honor Society. She is a part of the Charger Boat newspaper staff at Callaway High School. She served with the girls varsity soccer team and the girls track and field. Some of Cadet Colonel McLaurin's short and mid-range goals are to maintain her 3.8 grade point average yeah. and to be within the top 10 of her class and attend Emory-Riddle University after graduation. She also plans to serve in the United States Air Force as a commission officer after college. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you again Cadet Colonel Tylene McLaurin, the Cadet of the Year. Oops. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. I would first like to thank Dr. Gr Br Green and all the members of the school board for recognizing me this evening. It is an honor to be selected as the cadet of the year and to accept this leadership position as the brigade commander. I will serve in this role with honor and dignity. I also plan to open up more opportunities for our cadets to be more involved in our community. 
create more opportunities to expand the outreach of our program and welcome more students into our program. I truly plan on fulfilling our mission to motivate young people to be better citizens. Again, I would like to thank everyone for having me this evening. One district, one direction. Indeed, indeed. Board members, we have the, uh, the Callaway leadership team. We should probably get a picture with the entire team with um, Cadet Colonel McLaurin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm so glad you gave that stat because I was just sitting here thinking Callaway has had several. Uh, four years in a row for Callaway, yeah. um, uh, a Callaway uh, a cadet earning the cadet colonel, right? Well, okay, brigade leader. Um, really remarkable, super excited. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a bit uh, better and, and working alongside you as uh, another leader in our district, mm -hmm. cadet colonel. Um, thank you again, uh, Colonel Brown, for, um, for making that presentation. I, uh, I'm sorry, board members, I was given um, a correction that I need to make. The, the number for, uh, in case there are emergencies, the number to contact central office is 769-798-8566. Uh, again, that's 769 798 8566. That's the correct number should anyone need to contact us. Hopefully, um, we'll be getting the word now. Oh, well, we're getting there. Okay, hopefully, really soon, we'll be getting the word that uh, things will be back in order. Um, I know Erin Mason and her team are working super, super hard to get that fixed. I was working late hours into the night last night, so appreciate their efforts. Um, uh, again, with that recognition of uh, Cadet Colonel McLaurin, uh, that concludes all of my comments for this evening. Um, happy to take any questions or any commentary from board members, but I turn it back to you, Dr. Sivak. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you for the um, update, uh, all the great news about the foundation funding, how our scholars are at the table um, weighing in. That's an incredible update. Just want to again commend Cadet uh, Colonel McLaurin um, and just the way she referenced uh, increasing community outreach. Uh, there were a lot of values that align with, with this board. Um, also, I just want to comment on your um, um, the uh, preparation around uh, proposal to um, increase the compensation for our classified workers. I know as a board that is something that we are committed to as well and look forward to that proposal um, and working with uh, Mr. Burke and the finance team um, to get there. Board members, I do not believe that we have any public comments tonight, so I'll just use this opportunity to remind uh, the public that community members who would like to make public comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Uh, we have several information action items. This first one will be uh, shared with us with, by Dr. Green, I believe. Uh, this is the request to approve the agreement between urban data strategies in the Jackson Public School District. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Uh, Dr. Sivak, board members, uh, the district administration is requesting the Board of Trustees to approve the agreement between Urban Data Strategies, LLC, and the Jackson Public School District to address continued in inequalities and inequities in scholars' access to internet-based instruction. JPS seeks to deploy wireless internet <laughs> access capability 
um, for providing an enhanced level of internet access to JPS K-12 scholars within the city of Jackson. Um, just a, a note to uh, further clarify, this is a project that we've actually been working on for a couple of years. It started, um, it, it was actually presented to us or proposed to us by the city of Jackson, former uh, leadership there in the city of Jackson. And, um, and really what sparked it was the, during the pandemic, the effort to get as many of our scholars and their families connected as possible. We obviously have utilized ESER dollars to um, purchase more devices and um, uh, some hot spots and that sort of thing. But um, as much as we're building up internet connectivity and um, capacity within our district, many of our scholars go home to a lack of capacity, a lack of connectivity. And so this is um, really an effort, um, a bit of a pilot, but a, a proof of concept, uh, an effort for us to uh, create something that we believe could be scaled um, as we continue to think about what are all the moving parts and how do we engage and who might scale and, and continue to build on um, this work beyond the, the current scope, but um, currently scoped at 300 scholars in, the, um, in three school shuts, three school communities, Lanier, mm -hmm. Provine, and Wingfield. Wingfield, thank you. Lanier, Provine, and Wingfield, um, uh, just based on uh, initial estimates and data as to who, um, where the greatest need for connectivity might be. Um, so we're excited to bring this to you. It's been, it's been a long road to get to this place, and so we request your uh, support. Thank you, Dr. Green. Board members, are there any questions or comments? I only have a question in regards to the city. I, you said, you know, that it was in talks before. So um, even for future references, is there any further talks with the city to help, you know, even to continue? Like, is the city planning to do more? Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure. We, um, what I've heard from our top city official, our, our mayor and, and others in the city is that they, um, they support the effort. Mm -hmm. They would like, they see the need for um, wireless uh, connectivity for more of our, our residents. Um, you know, we all have our hands full. Um, this, we were, we fell into a couple of, um, or hit a couple <laughs> of barriers, just logistically for getting it up and running. Um, and we were able to bring it in house and, and um, reconsider how to set up the, the antenna um, without utilizing the current uh, city's infrastructure. And so um, we, don't, we don't necessarily see ourselves as the sole owners and providers or, or um, those who necessarily should be doing this long term, but um, seeing the need and opportunity, we wanted to seize it for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Green, I do have a question. Sure. It's probably a little bit more Maybe it's not, maybe it's more technical than not exactly what is it that we're doing and what are we expounding on? <laughs> yes, <laughs> great question. <laughs> Probably should have said more about that. <laughs> so um, really this is a, a system, a, a, um, a strategy to boost mm -hmm. our JPS network, wireless network to boost it from schools further out into community. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, with the same uh, um, firewalls and, and security systems and um, filters and all the things that we have in our schools, in our wireless system already, by boosting the signal, that would remain in place. And so really it's just an effort for scholars to be able to access more of their learning opportunities at home using um, antenna that would be mounted on those three schools um, for a, a catchment area around the schools. We, we pardon me? I think it's one. one. I think it was one mile. Oh, one mile, sorry, <laughs> one mile. Yes, um, around the antenna. And, and um, the scholars, the families would be provided a router at their home to pick up the signal. 
Um, and we have the capacity to support 300, up to 300 right now um, with this, this, um, this proposal that we're, we're bringing to you. But, but that's essentially it, boosting our signal out into the community so that those who have the router and can pick it up can, can tap into our system. Again, with all the safeguards, all the firewalls and filters that already exist, that was something that we were um, um, determined to, to have in place. So then my next question would be sort of on the process, since it's only 300, um, how do families, will there be a process for families applying and getting the routers? And we'll, we'll have to um, develop the, the it's, it's probably going to be more of a first come, first serve, but, but within that catchment area, right? So only around those schools. Um, it's uh, for two years worth of service. Uh, I was just reminded for two years worth of service, so that's pretty awesome. Um, and um, Obviously, there's got to be a commitment from the family to engage with us, and, and there's a, a part of this program is um, a technical assistance provision um, through the Bean Path um, organization uh, who are willing to partner with us and support um, with any needs that families might have over time. It's, it's pretty awesome. It is. <laughs> Wish, wish we could do much, much more, but you know, we, we want to make sure that it works and it's something that makes sense and we can learn from this proof of concept, this pilot. So I have another question then, and this is with the high schools where it will be placed, but some of our school, other schools and students, are they able to access it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's it, it was not intended just for high school scholars, but looking at those neighborhoods where high schools are as well. Um, just looking at elevation, mm -hmm. we we looked at the buildings and where they're how they're positioned, and you know all the smart people got together, the engineers, and helped us to think about where we might best position the antenna on top of our buildings to have the widest um, uh, uh, dispatch broadcast of the signal. So that student need would be basically, or like a family would get it, and whether they was in the high school or the middle school or yes, high school within that area. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any more questions? Comments? Just one more comment. Just based off of these numbers, then in that vein. There's no telling how many JPS students will actually be affected by Absolutely. it. Exactly. That's, that's great. Exactly. If there are multiple scholars within a home. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And typically there are. Yeah, my house for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have high hopes for what we'll learn from this um, and, and, the, and the network that this will, not technical network, the network of organizations and other places that this will um, open us up to, to learn from and, and build on what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Exciting. The big leagues. All right, who wants to make the motion on this one? I so move. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved, Mrs. Johnson has second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green. We look forward to continued progress. Uh, next, we have the request to approve the agreement between the Community Foundation of Mississippi and the Jackson Public School District. Uh, attorney Turner, our board attorney, will present this information. Well, I get the less exciting one. <laughs> but um, board members, you may recall that at the last board meeting, you approved a grant agreement with the Phil Harton Foundation. Um, they are donating to the district $375,000 over a period of three years to be used by the district for the community schools project. Um, and then tonight, you just approved the urban data strategies. Um, one common element in both of those grants is that the money
money from the grantors is being funneled through the Community Foundation of Mississippi. And so um, I thought it was necessary that we have in place some sort of document that would memorialize the arrangement between JPS and the Community Foundation by which the Community Foundation would receive the money, JPS would you know, solicit the services um, that the money will be used for, in this case, urban data strategies. It's about $466,000 and some change. And then obviously the district will be hiring folks or retaining services and equipment or supplies for the use of the Phil Harden funds. So in any event, what you have before you is just a simple MOU that says um, the community foundation will act as the fiscal agent for those two grants. It does allow for the possibility that they could serve in that capacity in the future, but that would have to be accomplished by an amendment that would come back to the board to add anyone to the grant agreement. Um, the community foundation, um, <coughs> as part of their responsibilities as a fiscal agent, also are required to, you know, just like JPS, be sure that the monies are spent in compliance with the grant requirements, and so they will have some administrative role. Um, they will be paid a fee that the district will negotiate on a case-by-case -case basis. The Kellogg grant, I think, goes back a while, and they've already received the administrative fee that they were going to get in connection with that grant. But for the Phil Harden Foundation grant, they'll be paid a total of $28,125. JPS will get its money in equal annual installments, and the Community Foundation will be paid in equal annual installments at the same time. Um, so as I said, this just memorializes that arrangement. It requires that for each grant, the district will get together with the Community Foundation, and they'll determine the logistics of you know, how process or how expenses will be processed, but it would contemplate that JPS would incur the, you know, acquire the services, acquire the equipment, an invoice would come, um, JPS would approve it, and once JPS approved it, then the community foundation would pay it. Um, I did also include language in there that would require that no grant funds that are intended for JPS would be paid to the community foundation, that the administrative fee that the community foundation would get <coughs> would have to be with grant funds other than the funds that are to go to JPS. So that's pretty much the basics of the agreement. If y'all have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you, Attorney Turner. Board members, any questions, comments? All right, hear none. Is there a motion to approve? I so move. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, we will invite Mr. Burke up. Uh, to the podium. Mr. Burke has the next three items. Um, so Mr. Burke, I'll just ask you to walk through each one. We'll stop for questions, then we'll take them all up as a single slate. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, President Seaback. Uh, board, Dr. Green, I get the, the, the very <coughs> least of the stuff to talk about. My stuff is not nearly as exciting about stuff. As, as, it's the money. as wireless internet for our students. Uh, so the first item is uh, the administration requests that, that uh, the JPS Board of Trustees approve the proposed sublease leasing uh, co-location co uh, agreement between American Tower, Lessee, the American Tower, our lessee, and Central uh, Cellular South Real Estate uh, incorporated a sub lessee of 16 section property on parcel 203210. Uh, this is uh, American Tower Corporation is a global real estate investment trust, uh, is an independent owner, operator, and developer of wireless and broadcast communications real estate. They currently operate a cell tower on this property for an annual lease amount of $16,500. Additionally, under a subleasing provision uh, granted in their lease, other companies may sublease space on their cell tower to place their equipment. Uh, in this relationship, Jackson Public Schools shares the sublease rents, receiving 15% of the yearly gross uh, of rentals that American Tower receives from tower tenants, users, and sub lessees. American Tower, the lessee, continues to perform all obligations under the lease agreement. Subleasing is only permitted if the lease contains a clause allowing that, uh, the, lease, the lessee to do so or with the express approval of this board under Mississippi Code 29369. So we're recommending that we allow them to sublet a space on the cell tower. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Board members, are there any questions, comments? 
Hearing none. So, we'll, oh, sorry. Moving <laughs> too fast. Mrs. Johnson. So two payments. The the annual rent of sixteen five. Yes, ma'am. And then fifteen percent of whatever they sublet it for. Yes, ma'am. Just wanted to make sure. These are these are really cool leases because they can <coughs> they can have more and more lessees um, representing different sales or companies, and we get a portion of that revenue. Okay. Do we have a do we have more than one of these type leases? I don't think so. I think this is the one we have, but uh, we're looking for more. All right, thank you. Um, next, Mr. Burke, we will go on to hear uh, the request to approve for the cancellation and release of the 16th section lease agreement between Jackson Public Schools and multiple landholders. Yes, sir. The administration requests the Board of Trustees to approve 16th section uh, cancellation agreements between Jackson Public School District and other and various lessees. Uh, Jackson Public School District Board of Trustees declared these leases in default for non-payment of rent in a prior board meeting. Uh, it is therefore necessary to cancel and release these lease agreements according to terms and authorize the land manager to take such actions as may be required to take possession of the lease premises and collect all amounts due and to do all other things necessary and appropriate to enforce the lease provisions uh, on defaults and remedies. Uh, we presented to you in a prior board meeting eight leases that were defaulted. We should have um, more appropriately come with the cancellation, and the default was the reason for the for the cancellation. So in future, you will get these. They will be the reason, and then you'll have the can. The, we'll use cancellation and explain to you the reason to speed this process up. Thank you, Mr. Burke. You're welcome. Board members, are there any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the request to approve the monthly financial report for the month ended February 28th, 2023. And just as a, as a further note to that, uh, one little note to that, this is a part of our cleanup of our 16th section records. Mm -hmm. You will have a more thorough presentation at some point. Um, we'll prepare a more thorough presentation to you about the actions that we're taking to, to continue that effort. But this is just one of those steps. The administration recommends that the board approve the monthly financial report for the month ending February 28, 2023. The monthly financial report contains the statement of fund balance, budget status report, bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow report. Highlights of that report are as follows. Uh, the statement for the statement of fund balance, the general fund section funds, 11, uh, funds 1,000 through uh, 1999 as referenced on page four, the preliminary Ending fund balance as of uh, 2028 was $18,060,897. This balance is approximately $4.5 million higher than it has been in prior years. This continues to be a result of our strong beginning fund balance and the efforts that we take each month to make sure that we are um, monitoring our expenditures relative to the collections of revenues. Uh, this remaining expenditures are higher than revenues by approximately 3.8 million. And then from the 16th section revenue that's also accounted for in that section, uh, we've so far year to date made about, about 600, a little under $600,000, which is about 63% of what we budgeted to receive. So we're still working toward uh, getting to that budgetary number. Special revenue funds, funds uh, 2000 through 29.99. Um, represented here are our child nutrition funds, our title, our <coughs> coronavirus, IDEA, other special revenue funds. Child nutrition, as referenced on page seven of your financial report, is, is still has a significant a balance of about 12 million. Uh, title funds represent, um, title funds show a negative balance, but again, that's due to the timing of the drawdowns. We have made some tremendous strides in terms of tightening up our uh, fund balance amounts. Uh, Last month's report, I, we had a, um, a deficit of about 13, a little over 13 million. We closed that to 6.9. And as of uh, the 13th, we have another 4.4 that we've requested in drawdown. So you can see that number is getting closer and closer. Um, fund, uh, fund drawdowns are prepared and submitted on the 12th of each month. And those negative balances, just as a reminder, are covered by district maintenance until those funds are received. Uh, page, uh, the budget status report, as of February 28th, district maintenance fund 1120, the budget of revenues collected was 63.3, uh, 63.6%, which is equates to about $119 million. Our budget funded expenditures from that same fund was 65%, and that equates to about 124 million. That's referenced on page 13. 
all other funds, uh, accounting for all other funds besides district maintenance, our budgeted revenues and all other funds, we've collected about 28.9% of those, uh, which is 86.1 million, and our budgeted expenditures, 27.7%, is about 94.4 million. All, total all funds together, our total budgeted revenues collected, uh, the total bu budgeted revenues is 485.8 million. We've collected 205.9 million of that, which is 42.39% of what we budgeted to collect this year. Budgeted expenditures, we have 529.3 million. We've expended uh, 218 million, which is 41.23%. The difference uh, there is made up from our fund balance, uh, budgeted fund balance. Bank reconciliation report, <coughs> bank, re bank reconciliations are uh, complete through January 31st and have all, and all our funds and accounts are with board approved depositories. Bank statements are reconciled appropriately and timely. Cash flow report section, as of 20, uh, February 28th, for district maintenance fund 1120, the ending cash balance was 7.4 million compared to 6.1 million in February of 2022. This is 20 uh, 20.47 percent higher uh, than the prior year, which equates to about 1.3 million dollars over last year's position. And then some final indicators, uh, management key performance indicators, headlines just for uh, February 28th. Our revenues collections year to date are 3.7 uh, million ahead of this time last year. Our year-to-date expenditures on personnel costs are 0.63 percent less than what we spent last year as a percentage of budget, and our overall percentage of expenditures year to date is 1.27% more than what we spent last year. So, uh, so two positives and um, one that we're just watching. That 1.2%, that uh, it could be timing, but we'll continue to watch that through the remainder of the year. And that is the financial report, and I'll entertain any questions, comments, or criticisms thereof. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Berg. Board members, do you have any questions? I have two questions and a comment. Yes, sir. Um, on the, uh, uh, question, on the um, update on title dollars, how we've been going down, and, and um, that's really exciting to see. Is, is the benefit of getting that, I don't, we'll probably never have that number at zero, because if we're, but however, is the benefit of, of getting it closer to zero uh, cash flow? Um, yes. And sports, we just makes it more liquid or? Absolutely. Uh, so every dime we spend that we hold in, in terms of uh, covering those expenditures weakens our cash flow on the district maintenance side. So when we're carrying $16 million in title, that's $16 million less than we have to put toward other other operational expenses, mm -hmm. so it is a, it's a cash flow concern. So the tighter you can get that, the more timely those submis submissions to MD, the more timely they they approve them and get that money back to us. It frees us up to, to be more liquid and more nimble. And of course, you know uh, that issue is more acute while we have this short window in which to use ESER dollars. Right. Exactly. Yes. And That's so we've got to be as liquid as possible to move those projects along. Yes. Yes, because you, yeah, you, we got vendors. We we're out in front of that. We've got vendors that want we need to pay so that we can get the risk invoices. We can get them submitted, so we can do the continuation of that work. That's great. Thank you for connecting those those dots. Um, I also noticed on the um, cash flow report that uh, abalorums uh, started. The big abalorums started yes. coming. In. How how did how are they looking this year? Uh, they're looking very good, okay. very good. Um, I was, I had some momentary trepidation, uh, <laughs> learning, learning how how we get money here. Um, but my people have been explaining to me that we get two checks instead of one, so that that made me feel better. Then we got the second one. I was like, okay, good. I, I can sleep a little better now. Yeah. So no, it's 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 coming in in line with what we budgeted. Okay, that's great. Uh, um, did, no, I was just saying good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the last point, um, this, you, this may have been there, but it was the first time I noticed it um, in the cash flow report. I know um, board members, we've uh, at times been um, eager to know what the charter school payment is, and I saw that there is a line added in the expenses, so that number is there. And I believe every month we get this. That I mean, it'll move as the calendar moves, but it's in the it's in the report. So, thank you for putting that number in there um, and keeping it so we have clear sight to mm -hmm. 
that expenditure. With that, board members, is there another question? I, yes, I have one. It's just um, the 43.5 million budget overage. Is this a result of maybe one time expenses or is our budget increasing? Where are we talking? What, what We're are talking we? about the all funds. Yes. Okay, so <coughs> this was not in the report before. And my notes did not make it into this copy, so I'll apologize for that because Dr. Green and I did discuss, I need to explain that a little bit better. So we, we, we constantly talk in terms of district maintenance. We never really talk holistically about the budget. Mm -hmm. We have other funds besides district maintenance. So it's important that we, district, it's important to focus on district maintenance because that's our main operations fund, but I also want you to have the wider context of, of the total amount of money that you control as a board. The total amount of money that you budgeted was 529 million dollars. That is, that's what you budgeted for expenses. Revenue new money coming in, we budgeted 485.8. That difference is made up of money that we already have in-house. That's the fund balance piece of that. So you're budgeting, so you have that sort of savings for, yeah, for the sake of argument, it's the savings that you have, and then you budget that as a part of your new year expenditures. So that's where the difference comes from. So is that something, is that typical that we, okay. yes. so yes. we go into our savings every year annually with our budget? Well, you're not going necessarily going into your savings. You go into this amount of money you already have on hand. That's a part of your budget process. So you have money in, in, already in the bank that we've already collected in terms of Avalorum, in terms of MAP, whatever that is. And then we budget that in, in addition to any new revenues that come in. Okay. So now I'm a little confused. Yeah, the savings term is, is yeah, well, let me, let me, he, he hesitated on it, but yeah, it's a little problematic. I was trying to, yeah, it's problematic. So it's not a savings. Okay. It is just the money we have. We spend, we spend, and at some point at June 30th, we have money left over that we have not spent. Yes. Is that technically like the, what the fund balance? That's the fund balance. I mean, okay, so. Yes. But again, um, earlier comment, we typically talk about the fund balance as just those dollars. dollars in um, district maintenance. maintenance. Yes, but there are fund balance numbers in every one of these funds okay. that are just sitting there. So right. we, this, this report reflect, that number reflects these other amounts. So you have that $21 million that we started with district maintenance, but if you do this calculation, that's a bigger number. So that's other parts are in other funds. They're in child nutrition, they're in uh, special ed, they're in all these other things that we have. And so we're continuing to budget, so when you budget, you're budgeting those numbers to be spent the next year, and sometimes you just don't spend them down. So at the end of that cutoff, you still have that amount left over that you budget the next year, and this okay. cycle continues. Okay, okay so, so it's, it's not, a, it's not savings account was the wrong term. So it's just money that we constantly move in, it, in that snapshot. When we take this number, you have these dollars that are remaining that you didn't spend, whether that was because costs were lower, you didn't hire the people, whatever that is, that number is still there. You budget, we, we plan to use it, and then again, it happens again. And so we ha the, the law requires us in district maintenance to keep a certain amount, but it doesn't require us in these other funds to have anything other than a zero. But, but you constantly have these numbers that, that are sitting there. Does that help? It, it does. And then so I guess then the fund balance, is that connected to our um, bond rating? It's connected to your bond rating. There's also the fiduciary responsibility under the law to have a certain percentage of, of fund balance to make sure, you, for op, from an operational standpoint, that you always have some liquidity there, particularly for the reasons of cash flow. Because if we didn't have any money, let's say we spent everything down to zero, we wouldn't be able to spend any federal funds because that's reimbursement. We'd go into negative right on the first federal expenditure. So we always have to have this amount of fund balance that we're constantly budgeting into to keep, our, keep us operationally going. Very helpful, thank you. Okay. Sometimes it gets, yeah. Yeah. No, very yeah. Trying to figure out, a, sometimes trying to find a simple explanation sometimes can confuse it. So savings account was the wrong. Well, no, no, you got me there, yeah. thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> do, we, do we usually not hit, our, hit the, the budget amount? Is that why we have carryover? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because so it's, it's, it's theoretically, if we spent all $529 million, we wouldn't have that you, you going wouldn't in have next that year. as much. We still, we, that still takes into account a 
some that you have to leave there. Okay. So we're not spending every dime of fund balance. There's still that requirement to have this seven or ten or whatever the board's that the law says or whatever the board has over that. So that's not reflected. But here. that's not reflected there. No. Okay, that helps. This is this is only reflects the amount, and, and there, there should have been another line here that told you exactly what that number was. So I'll make sure it gets there next time. That would be helpful. And maybe even could you email it out? Yeah, um, just so we can connect yeah, it to this yeah, information. Yeah, I just I don't think I sent the right one. Okay. Any other questions, board members? Comments. Okay. Hearing none. Is there a motion to approve information action items C through E? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Mrs. Johnson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, thank you, Mr. Burke. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, our consent agenda items finance. All of the items have been presented in advance, and the board member has had the opportunity to ask questions of the board, of the administration. Board members, are there any more questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda for finance? So moved. Second. <coughs> Mrs. Johnson has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda item general. Um, all the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items general? I so move. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Mrs. Thompson has second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda items personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda personnel? So moved. Second. Mrs. Johnson has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Do not believe there is any executive session items all right board members is there a motion to adjourn so moved <laughs> second <laughs> mrs thompson has moved dr harrison is second all in favor aye <laughs> thank you everyone and have a great a evening. great meeting y'all